Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be with you today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you on such a gloriously sunny morning in Strasbourg. Um, I am not a lawyer. I have no legal background, uh, so I will not cite precedent or delve into case law. Uh, indeed, when I was uh, invited to come and speak to the Strasbourg Conference on International Law, I protested to the organizers that I could think of at least 10 people far better qualified than I am, to which they replied, so can we, Sir Graham, but they've all turned us down. <laughs> so you have me. Let me share with you um, some thoughts this morning on the development of international law uh, when it comes to sustainability. Um, I, as I say, I'm not a legislator, I'm not a lawyer, but I am a legislator. Uh, and I've had the great privilege to work on laws and legislation governing the environment, development, and sustainability, both in my role as a member of the European Parliament and in my role as chairman of the Climate Parliament. And it is probably in that capacity that I am best qualified to speak to you today not of legal theory or of jurisprudence, but of the principles and priorities that must support any international legal commitment to sustainable development. The Climate Parliament is a network of legislators across the world, an informal network. We bring together people in different national parliaments who are interested in working on climate issues and particularly, and this is where we differ from some other similar organizations, particularly legislators interested in speeding up the switch from fossil fuels to low carbon energy sources. And we work at least as much on the distribution of electricity as we do on the generation of electricity from renewable sources. But to give you an idea of how we work, and what we've achieved. We work together with legislators in different parliaments and look at what we can do each in our own parliament and what we can achieve. And if I give you just three recent successes, uh, we now have climate and sustainable development enshrined in the new Tunisian constitution. Tunisia is only the third country in the world explicitly to commit itself to government action to mitigate climate change. In India, our members of parliament have more than doubled the national budget for renewable energy, and they have helped to increase the 2020 renewable energy target from 6% to 15%. My third example is from the European Parliament where I sit, where through amendments to legislation, we have secured at least 2.9 billion euros from the Connecting Europe facility for the development of electricity interconnectors and have guaranteed that 85% of the research budget will go to renewables rather than to the development of oil and gas. They'll go into things like efficiency, smart grids, storage, developing alternatives to fossil fuels, and so on. And I believe that legislative successes such as these at the national or European level can have a profound knock-on impact on international law. Countries that already have strong environmental laws at home will be more likely to push for robust legal frameworks to govern international action on climate sustainability, and enshrining environmental protection sustainability in the national laws demonstrates the seriousness of a country's commitment to climate action at international negotiations. Perhaps it also makes it easier to reach international agreement by dealing with the problem of free riders, the more nations that have national commitments to environmental protection, the fewer will stand to benefit from standing aside while others undertake sacrifices in the name of the environment. 
And so I would argue that the work of legislators in national parliaments is an essential and a complementary process that can only strengthen if efforts to reach international consensus on binding climate treaties. They are, if you like, a parallel track to international negotiations. Um, last week in the European Parliament, uh, Ban Ki-moon came to talk to us about his plans for a uh, meeting in the summer of this year where he hopes that he will be able to secure an agreement in Lima to an internationally binding climate treaty in Paris next year. I think we are on the verge of something important and something that will take us forward because I think that it is becoming harder and harder to deny that we are already seeing the impacts if not of man-made, then at least of man-accelerated climate change. During my time as a legislator, it has been my great privilege to meet fellow members of parliament from all across the, the globe. And in conversations with them on these issues, I've noticed that consistent themes have emerged, which I think will be important in our development of international law. The first, of course, is the urgency of the climate challenge, the essential motivating factor for why the dominant global paradigm of reckless economic growth, heedless of environmental impact, <coughs> needs to be reassessed. The second is an understanding of what sustainable development actually means as a legal norm and as a practical concept for the legislators that I work with. I think it's not necessary to sketch to you the severity of the climate challenge that confronts any proponent of sustainable development. Uh, we know that since the Industrial Revolution, nearly 200 years ago, the burning of coal, gas and oil has allowed a privileged subset of humankind to have access to truly staggering amounts of energy. That energy has been used for the transport that brought us to this conference. It's used for the electricity that heats our lights and lights and our homes. And most of all, it's used for the economic development which the wealthier countries on the globe have seen. Indeed, you could say that the development of fossil fuels has driven human development to a peak which is unprecedented in history, but it is unsustainable, and not only because fossil fuels themselves are a finite resource. And increasingly, our constituents everywhere are feeling the impact of climate change and calling for change, change in government policy. It may be that they feel the relentless desertification of once fertile land in the Maghreb, that they suffer from heat waves in East Africa, or that in my constituency in the southwest of England, they have recently been flooded two years running. The message is the same. Climate change is here. Unless we do something about it, it will get worse. And the latest reports from the International Panel on Climate Change make a very uncomfortable reading. And perhaps most of all, the scarcity of food and water and the impact they will have on the prices of staple uh, diets are going to lead to considerable pressure uh, on our societies. Now, how are we going to shift the global paradigm of economic development from its current basis to a new footing? rooted in the principles of sustainability and equity? Can we do it without the kind of international cooperation in a binding legal framework that seemed so distant even recently at Copenhagen, at Cancun, at Durban, at Doha, in Warsaw? The choice is stark. Either we enshrine sustainability in the international system 
or we condemn present and future generations to a world scarred by drought, disease, heat waves, famines, and epidemics. I think probably Lord Stern, the chairman of the IPCC, summed up climate change best. He said, you can reduce climate change to eight words, he said, and it's all about water. Too much, too little, wrong time, wrong place. And it doesn't matter whether you're in California or whether you are at the edges of the Sahara Desert, you recognize that already. Many of the members of parliament that I work with represent constituencies which are extremely poor. We have over a billion people in the world without access to the modern energy services that could provide them with reliable lighting, fuel, and energy for development. Almost 1.3 billion are living on less than one US dollar a day. Women are still trekking for miles to gather traditional fuels like wood and dung, to run dirty and dangerous cooking stoves that are belching poisonous smoke into their homes. Children still too often have no light in the dark evenings for reading or study. Many parts of the world, mobile phones cannot be charged. Entrepreneurs cannot power their businesses. Potentially life-saving medicines cannot be properly refrigerated. So sustainable development is called for, and we have to define it and to anchor it in law. My own personal definition, based on my experience in the European Parliament and on the conversations that I've had with fellow members of Parliament, with climate ex experts, with policy analysis, is that truly sustainable development will be based on equity and on integration. Equity in that it must distribute the benefits and costs of development fairly, both between and within generations. And integration in that it must seek to reconcile, rather than simply balance, the competing objectives of economic growth, social justice, and environmental uh, protection. Now, I want to explore both of those concepts, equity and integration, because these are not known terms in international law. I think if you start with equity, probably the best is the definition that you find written now almost 30 years ago in the Brundtland Report in 1982. It is development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, that formulation contains an important truth, which is that to be really sustainable, development must recognize and weigh the competing claims of present and future generations. In other words, it must provide intergenerational equity. And any effective commitment to sustainability has to recognize that present day activities may disadvantage future generations. But uh, integration is important too, because we have to recognize that unless we are properly integrating our societies, we are going to find it much harder to deal with the needs of all. These are contentious issues. We must recognize that all countries have a legitimate right to development. We found it difficult to deal with these in the international conferences from the UNFCCC to the many other meetings that have taken place hitherto. I personally profoundly disagree that with those who suggest that dealing with the climate crisis is the responsibility of richer industrialized nations alone though I believe that the industrialized nations will need to accept a far greater burden of responsibility for dealing with the challenge that we face. But we have emerging economies already emitting as a group more carbon than the OECD countries. And while carbon emissions appear to have peaked in the industrialized world, uh, they show no sign of slowing down in emerging economies. 
Secondly, the impact of climate change is going to fall disproportionately on the citizens of the global south. And that's why we have to look at cooperation and communal action. And I think blame mongering is a dangerous distraction from the urgent task that we have at hand. If development's going to be sustainable, it has to accommodate three different and perhaps incompatible values. Economic growth, environmental protection, and social justice. It's not easy to reconcile those three. You know, you might decide that the value of economic growth trumps the other two and should be given priority in cases of conflict. That is how the world currently operates. I'm not sure that it's the way to a wealthier or happier future. You might argue, as some do, that you place ecological concerns in pole position and ensure that environmental protection trumps economic development. But that is equally unhelpful because if you throw out economic development in the name of ecological preservation, then you're never going to lift the world's poor into prosperity. And I'm not sure that we should be prepared either to sacrifice principles of social justice on the altar of dealing with the climate challenge. So you can't simply elevate one of the three economic growth, environment, or social justice over the others. You have to try to integrate the three of them based on the fundamental recognition that they are mutually interdependent, that they are self-reinforcing principles that cannot be sustained without the support of others, that they are, if you like, three legs of the same stool. And I think that even the most flinty-eyed free market capitalist is driven by the same basic human urges to provide for their family and improve the lot of their descendants as anybody else. So let us not prioritize one over others. Let us work on getting them all together. If we fail to do that, I think the political instability that will be generated by runaway climate change will threaten all three will certainly threaten economic growth, will certainly threaten social freedoms, and I believe, too, it will threaten the environmental and ecological balance. In a world where even food and water are in short supply, would human needs like freedom of conscience come to be seen as extravagant luxuries? I think any definition of sustainable development, legal or otherwise, has to take account of all of these three objectives. We are, I would say in conclusion, a long way from the development of international law in the field of environmental sustainability compared to the development of international law in other areas, whether it is in the area of trade, whether it's in the area of protection of human rights, whether it is in areas where increasingly countries have found it essential to work together to deal with challenges that are supranational and require supranational solutions. But I have no doubt that unless we are able to achieve a legally binding global climate treaty and build around that the architecture that will enforce and implement those laws, then we are in for a period of lawlessness in the global community, which could be the destruction of us all. <laughs>